Uh, hello, and uh, welcome, and thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Adlet Roman, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Mannheim. I'm doing business ethics with a focus in technology. And uh, today I will talk about motivational appeals to overcome biases in technology design. Um, since there's so few of us, uh, feel free to raise your hand and ask any questions if it gets too blurry, if it gets too complicated in the end. And yeah, I hope uh, to get your feedback and comments and answer your questions um, as you have them. So today I will give a brief introduction on types of bias. I will start very broad. I will speak a little bit about algorithmic fairness, um, but that's not going to be the, the main topic of today. I'm actually just uh, going to focus on the representational harms uh, in artificial intelligence and then introduce you to my um, research uh, design, my experimental design, our findings, and uh, listen, and the implications that uh, we found. So let's get to it. Um, computer ethicists have identified three main um, types of biases. The first one, technical bias, which we hear often, um, which are the limitations and constraints of the technology itself, um, also could be biased data. And an example of this uh, is Amazon's recognition system uh, performing the worst for darker females. The second type, and a, a very important one, is the pre-existing uh, social bias, which as its name says, it's a bias that exists before deploying our model. And this is very important because if we don't understand the social context and the potential society's bias that the model will augment or amplify, our whole model um, will not be successful. And an example of this is a medical algorithm which wanted to identify patients with the most complex healthcare need. Um, the programmers, of course, uh, with all the well intention, thought that if they could, that they could predict complex healthcare needs from how much money a patient spends on their healthcare. And this causal theory, which evolves from our own lived experiences, unfortunately ignored the pre-existing social bias that in the United States there's a racial gap uh, of access to health care, there's a, a wealth gap as well, and there's other uh, factors um, of structural inequalities in the healthcare system uh, that will, of course, bias our results and create emergent bias, which is new, bias, uh, new biases created from our model. So, the thing is that algorithmic fairness was not very popular until, re until recently. Most research in the machine learning field uh, focuses on optimizing accuracy. And as we know, computer science is a field uh, skewed in, in its demography. And the thing is that moral judgment often uh, is related to um, demography traits as well as our beliefs in fairness and discrimination. Um, Pearson in 2018 uh, showed evidence that females felt more strongly than males to exclude uh, the, the, the categorization of gender um, if that would make it less likely that women would be recommended STEM classes, even if it increases algorithms' accuracy. So, of course, accuracy and fairness, there's a trade-off there, and how, how we prioritize will depend on several factors, including, of course, personality, which we will see later. So why, why is this important for business? Well, of course, aside from the evident societal harm that um, automated decision-making uh, has the potential to, uh, to do, business wants to avoid scandals. We want to... Um, keep the trust of our customers in our company. We want to be reliable and accountable to our stakeholders and comply with human rights laws um, and non-discrimination laws and, of course, avoid discrimination lawsuits based on uh, prima facie discrimination due to AI. However, I'm going to focus on um, an under-researched 
harm, which is the representational harms, as I had already gave some examples of the allocative harms, which um, leads to economic harm as it, for example, continuously denying loans to women, right? Um, but the representational harms focuses more on the narrative that we reinforce about a group of people. Artificial intelligence is the biggest experiment in our history, classification experiment in our history. We are defining what it means to be black, white, what it means to be a woman, a man. And um, I focus here on the lack of representation of, a, of, of different ethnicities in the digital world, in the virtual world, which can lead to societal harms. Universe, um, experts at the University of Cambridge have problematized this as the whiteness in AI. And well, this refers to the portrayal of artificial intelligence as white in films, stock, Im stock images, in AI chatbots, virtual assistants, and they, they theorize that this could be as a, a neurocentric portrayal of intelligence uh, or, idea, or the idealized others, and we can see this also in female sex robots. So this raises the question of how will the future of race and gender develop in the, sub, in the subsequent autonomous stage of general AI? And because of this question, uh, that of course right now doesn't uh, look very optimistic, we, we thought, well, we need to engage programmers into social justice. We need to um, find ways to motivate programmers to look at their work, to have also um, agency, about, about their technology design. And so we also wanted to understand if the communicators' race and gender had an impact into, um, into this strategy. We know from uh, different literatures, especially the, the literature on confronting discrimination and bias, that message transportation depends on three things. The first thing is the characteristics of the audience, the characteristics of the speakers, and also the message framing. So in our experiment, we decided to manipulate the gender and race of the speaker, as well as the message framing um, in the framing in the negative or problem framing versus a solution or a positive framing, which we'll see um, ahead. But it's also important to know that stereotypes also influence the message reception. And stereotypes are pervasive. Research shows that low and high prejudiced people are aware of stereotypes. The difference is, the difference is whether we choose to apply them in our judgment or not. But humans use social categories, and that is not going away and especially with artificial intelligence. Um, feminists categorized by gender and high prejudiced people categorized by race and others categorized by physical attractiveness and such. So it's only natural. Um, and stereotypes are also inevitable when we meet someone from an out-group member, unless we have a goal to be egalitarian. And this goal to be egalitarian, or, or colorblind, we can say, is automatically activated when we see, uh, when these persons meet someone from the outgroup member. So this stereotype activation is what we measure in our experiment, as I will show you in a, in a, in a bit. And we do this through an implicit measure. So we want to measure real behavior and, real, and, and just realize how this changes across personality types. So after reviewing several literatures, we noticed that there was little talk about programmers' role in overcoming biases. Also, um, little empirical, empirical evidence uh, regarding interventions and bias reduction in technology design, as well as black women's experiences while confronting discrimination since most literature and most research evidence uses black people versus white people in their experiments, and intersectional theory um, theorizes that as black women face gender discrimination as well as racial discrimination, they have a unique experience that 
is not um, validated empirically, and that's what we try to do as well. Um, and last but not least, um, as we learned from the stereotype confrontation literature, um, minorities receive a backlash when they talk about discrimination. I will explain further why. And we attempted to reduce this backlash with the solution framing. We will see what happens. So what we did is um, an online experiment uh, with 590 programmers in Prolific. It was a two-by-two two between subject design, white, middle-aged um, programmers from the United States. As I said, we manipulated the race and the gender of the speaker, as well as the problem framing. This, both speakers um, actually uh, read the same paragraph. And just to summarize what the paragraph says, it explains bias in AI and how vulnerable populations as LGBTQ, people with disabilities, and women and people of color are the ones who tend to be most affected um, and not in the decision table. And so they both did videos where in one side there was you are part of the problem and in the other side there was the you are part of the solution. And that they should seek remedies to proactively um, address this issue. So after uh, looking into the, sorry, I cannot go back. Okay, well, I cannot go back, but after looking into this, um, after watching this video, they were presented with a mock website. And this is where we tried to measure the implicit bias and the real behavior. And this mock website showed a white AI chatbot of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with having a white AI chatbot, but you would think that after seeing a video explaining bias in AI and diversity, that you would at least uh, mention it, right? So, that's, so after we show the, 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 this website, we ask, what would, would, would you change about this website in an open text box? And we coded zero or one for those who mentioned um, anything about diversity. And this is our conceptual model. I will try to make it as digestible as possible. Our first, our first hypothesis, um, we expected the problem framing to be superior to the solution framing when it comes to the detection of potential bias. As I explained, the detection of potential bias was whether the programmer mentioned diversity or not. Right? This is our dependent variable. And this, we expected this to happen because the biggest predictors of pro-social behavior is guilt, fear, and shame. So, our second, this was also confirmed in our results. Our second hypothesis was that the white male speaker using the problem framing was going to be the most effective in increasing the detection of potential bias. And that it would be reversed for the black women. And I'm, I'm going to go slow into explaining why we expected this. So, when two members of the same race are um, having a conversation, the message is increased farther more than if they were of different races, generally. So, when race matches race, message, message reception increases. Also, there's a stereotype violation because it's not expected from the white man to talk about discrimination. It seems um, it's a surprise effect. It seems um, self, non-self-interest. And it also... Um, it seems non-self-interest, and it also reduces the threat. It reduces self-image threat as, as well as group threat. Meanwhile, when the black speaker uses a problem framing, she activates this, the angry black women stereotype. And instead of triggering guilt, which we need to predict a prosocial behavior, she triggers irritability most of the time. And the fact is that the literature says that targets of discrimination cannot trigger as much guilt as those who are not targets of discrimination. And we know that guilt is needed then. Um, so we continue and we further and last, lastly um, expect that this will depend on the individual's personality type. 
And here we use the social dominance orientation scale, which is related to beliefs of a just world, is also related to legitimizing inequality, and let's call it levels of prejudice. And we know that levels of prejudice also influences the message reception from members of stigmatized groups. So we expected that individuals with low levels of prejudice will have a reverse effect, a total reverse effect, from individuals with high levels of prejudice. And the reason why we expect this is because this high prejudiced individuals who are high in social dominance orientation, they have a goal to be egalitarian, they have a goal to be colorblind. And in experiments it has been shown that they are so mm, used to correcting the stereotype activation over time, so often that they can do this in less than 500 milliseconds from seeing at, a, at, a, at an environmental cue, for example, a, a black person. So this is what we capture in our experiment, this implicit measure. So most of our hypotheses were confirmed, except for uh, the black women and the message framing. I will explain more now. But as you can see, there's a reverse effects for low individuals and high individuals, for low prejudiced individuals and high prejudiced individuals. But let's go farther into it. So, as expected, uh, the white male speaker using the problem framing was the most effective in detecting uh, this potential bias. However, as we see here, it was not successful for the black women. And it doesn't matter if she uses the problem framing, it doesn't matter if she used the, the solution framing, she still um, gets this backlash for talking about discrimination. So this can tell us something about tone policy in black women. It really doesn't matter so much if she says it in a positive way, if it's in a negative way, it's just that, well, the literature also says that as is a stereotype confirmation, it's expected for minorities to talk about discrimination. So the message scrutiny is reduced. Um, and as it is not expected for a former white man to talk about discrimination, the message scrutiny then increases and, and it has a better effect. So we could not overcome this. Um, However, in the high prejudiced individuals, you will see this, that the black female speaker actually, using the problem framing, actually increases the most uh, bias detection, but actually has no difference as well if she uses the positive or the solution framing. There's no difference here. And this counterintuitive result is because of the mechanism that we explained of stereotype inhibition, which that's why it causes to be reversed. And we are doing uh, replications of this experiment to understand the mechanisms of exactly why this happened. Uh, but what we assume is that this could be done driven by anger or irritability. And that's why they mentioned diversity the most because of, of this, because she triggered more anger and irritability. So basically, uh, the takeaways are that we need allies. We cannot leave all the diversity work to people of color. And I think that this is a good argument against um, you know, tone policing uh, of black women. Doesn't matter if they say it in a positive way, doesn't matter if they say it in a negative way, just by talking about discrimination, they have to pay a price. And last but not least, when, when talking about bias and discrimination, it would be useful to have a diverse pool of speakers in order to reach different personalities and different peoples in the speakers. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so if there's any questions. Are you aware of any initiative? Can you speak a of the But for the presentation, uh, my question is, are you aware about of any initiative, um, business-oriented or not, that are employing such techniques to diminish bias with AI? Thanks. Yeah. Actually, I'm not aware. I'm not aware. Um, I'm aware, well, of, yeah, there are some, there are some guidance into how 
to talk uh, to, to an outgroup member audience about discrimination, uh, but I have not seen the manipulation of, of the message. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good. Then, okay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, small question about... Um, I can, talk. Sorry, I cannot understand very well. Uh, sorry, and now is it better? Okay. Uh, so when it comes to uh, machine learning, um, let's say the data sets, which don't have enough representation of all different races and types, mm -hmm. um, would you say it's better to have um, separate um, data sets for each type of different... Um, racial group or whatever, or do we put more? So, we, or do we include more in the same data set while training, something like that? Hmm. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Do you use any website to figure out uh, the distribution in your data? Like, oh, I don't have any data. I'm just a theoretical ah, okay. question. Just, ah, okay, okay, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends, but not n norm. I don't focus so much on on that. Uh, area of uh, distributive justice, uh, but yeah, the recommended thing is that they're um, all represented and that you can have like a, an idea of how your data is distributed between races and, and at least make sure that it's going to be fairly accurate between all race groups in your database. Similar to the normal machine learning where there's different types in, in each data set, you should have equal, um, every class has to be equally um, yeah, yeah. There's number. like a whole to debate on that topic. Like, you know, if you want to engage into that, there's like different ways to uh, to right. There's different definitions of fairness. There, you know, no one agrees on what fairness is or should be. So it, it's very contextual. Um, uh, but yeah, I would say that it's very contextual and depends. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Then, then thank you so much. <laughs>